It is so good to be here this morning uh, to be with you guys. Uh, actually, Brian uh, had preached at our church in McGee, Mississippi, right before the pandemic. It was like, yeah, the Sunday before uh, the pandemic. And um, so I'm grateful that he was able to preach there uh, at our church. And then, you know, was it three years later, he asked me to preach at his church. Uh, so it's been a long time coming uh, that I am here today with you guys. Love you guys so much. I actually visited here a few weeks back and just love the spirit and love what God is doing here. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to jump right in to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Now, we all need to understand something, okay? Perspective is changed by experience. Always. And you, you know this, right? You know this with people. One of the things that, that we deal with with people is we say, you shouldn't judge someone, right, until you've walked a mile in their shoes. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they've experienced. And so because of that, we have to understand that experience changes perspective. Always. It always has, and it always will. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So as we start out in Luke chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 25. And you have to understand what's happening here with Jesus, right? You have to understand that every time that Jesus gets a large following... These disciples, right, they feel like rock stars. They feel like that they're, uh, you know, backstage with the man and, and he's doing all these cool miracles and stuff. Then Jesus always, some crazy reason, turns around and thins the herd, right? Do you remember the time when they're all hanging out with Jesus after he fed the 5,000 people and they're like rock stars, right? These disciples are thinking, this is awesome. And Jesus gets up and he says, you got to drink my blood and eat my body. And everybody said, this is a hard saying. We got to leave. And so Jesus sees this crowd. And so that kind of starts us off where we're at. And it said in verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned to them and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Jesus gets up there and everybody's like, he's fixing to talk. Listen, listen to him. He's fixing to talk. You better hate your mama. You better hate your daddy. You better hate your kids. You better hate your brother. You better hate your sister. You don't even hate yourself. <laughs> You're not going to be my disciple. And everybody's like, okay, okay. Let's go on back home, okay, <laughs> right? But what's crazy about this situation is understanding what Jesus is actually saying. And it's something that we don't talk about a lot because it is a hard, difficult phrase that Jesus says here. So we gotta keep reading. And this is what he says. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, listen to this, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying the man began to build and was not able to finish. What king goes out to encounter another king in war? But will not sit down and first deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet he who comes against him with 20,000. If not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks terms for peace. Now look at this last verse here. So therefore, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, why this last verse is so important? Because it kind of goes into what's happening. Jesus is not telling these people you need to hate. He is not telling them you need to go to a place where you're against. 
But what this last verse says in this is this, there had better be nothing all the way to your mother and your father, your children, your wife, your husband. There had better be nothing in your life that you are not willing to renounce if Jesus Christ calls for it. You see, he says, you got to first count the cost. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. In the church, we don't do this enough. How many times have you seen people be baptized and celebrated in the church and then go on, right, and do their own thing? Why? Because we love decisions in the church. We love for people to be baptized. We like to count numbers. One of the things that Brian has to do every month, I think you still do it every month. You might not do it now. But used to do it every month is you just have to fill out a report saying this is how many people we had. And then he would repent for lying. <laughs> I did it. I'm not ashamed of it. How many did you have? Well, if you count everybody, this one woman's pregnant. That's two. <laughs> right? And, and you look, at we, 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 we have all these. So we want people to come in. We want big crowds. We want, but let me tell you something. If the church actually explained what it took to be a Christian, you would have a whole lot more people, I mean, a whole lot less people confessing Christ. And the reason why is we don't count the cost. I remember in 2007. Man, you know, I, I look at this. If you're not willing to hate your own life, if you're not willing to renounce all that you have, you can't be my disciple. And I remember loving that and feeling that and being that. And everybody celebrated that around me. And then in 2007, God called me to go on the foreign mission field to Kenya. Oh my gosh, it was so wonderful. You could feel the presence of God everywhere. I remember getting off the plane, experiencing that culture. Oh, it was just, it was so good. Man, I had never left the country ever until here. And I've got this team of people around me, and I'm, I've been pastoring for a while, and we're just a ragtag bunch of missionaries going to serve Jesus. And then war broke out while we were there. Okay, that's, that is not how this is supposed to play out. I saw the movie. People go and these people love everybody. The people trying to kill us. There was gunshots and people burning down stuff. And let me tell you, everybody was like, Pastor, what do we do? Pastor, what do we do? And I was like, all right, guys, everybody calm down. And listen to my words. I have no idea what we're supposed to be doing. I'm freaking out just as much as you are. But you're a pastor. Who cares? You know, I've never been in this situation before in my life. And we were hiding in an abandoned police department. It was so bad, the, the police left. And we were, we were hiding in this abandoned police station. And this guy comes up to me. He goes, how are you? I said, how do you think I am? This is bad. He looked at me and said, I'm a pastor. I was like, <laughs> me too, brother. He said, we're going to be fine. I was like, I'm glad you got faith right now because right now God is exposing everything in me. <laughs> he looked at me and said, we're going to be fine. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know faith and all that. And he turned to his side and he had an AK-47 on his side. I began to worship. <laughs> Praise God, my brother. God will deliver us, right? I want to tell you something. During that trip, 310 people came to know Jesus Christ. We went into a place we were not even supposed to go. Let me tell you what God did and what God taught me. God taught me that I had walked with him my entire life, and that was wrong. Because when I walk with God, my feet are on the ground, and I get to say which way I go. God carries me. And I'm going to tell you something. We don't always count the cost. Listen to me. There will be a time in your life where your faith does not work for you. There will be a time when you are going to be challenged. And Jesus says there should be nothing that pulls you to that thing. But you know what American faith looks like, guys? It looks like I want my cake and eat it too. 
I want everything Christianity has to offer, and I want everything the world has to offer all at one time. We call that religion. And religion sends more people to hell than anything else. Why? Because it has nothing to do with an all-out relationship with God that might cost you everything and being willing to renounce all for this. Jesus said something. He said, a man first has to lose his life if he wants to find it. And what does that mean? Does God want you to, to, to live in a monastery? Does God want you to renounce your family? Does God want you to walk away from this life and go into some hiding situation where you are just 100% devoted to God? No, but be willing if he asks you to do that. And the problem is we love Jesus until it rubs us the wrong way. I love this thought process that Jesus is saying is like, it's just going to cost you something. But, but listen to what he says. If you've, a man loses his life, he'll do what? He'll gain it. Yeah, you're going to give up a lot, but you're going to gain more than you can possibly imagine. You're going to give up toxic relationships that are in your life. But what I'm going to put in their place is going to blow your mind. You see, that's what God does. Now, what I want to show you in this, and this is so good, is I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 22. And we're going to explore this as we move forward. Genesis chapter 22, a very, very familiar passage in the Bible. And this is where Abraham sacrifices Isaac. I love this passage of scripture because of all of the pictures of God that it paints. So I want you to look at this with me. So basically, God calls out to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac. And I love this. Read it with me. In verse two, it says, he said, take your son, listen to this, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of foreshadowing right there. I want you, Abraham, to take your only son, the one you love, and I want you to make a burnt offering. Now, what we don't see there is what happens between verse 2 and verse 3. Because it looks like Abraham went, all right, Isaac, load up. Abraham was not a superhero, guys. Abraham was not Jesus. Abraham was not God. Abraham was obedient, but I'm here to tell you right now, there was a turmoil in that dad's heart that was brutal. And so God basically says this, are you willing to renounce all? Are you willing to put all of this to the side? And so he gets his son and they begin to walk up the mountain. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and will come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, <laughs> listen to this, laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and a knife. So when they went on both of them together, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, I see the fire, and there's the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they both went up there together. And when they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound 
Isaac. Guys, I want to bring that up to you real quick. He put the wood on his son's shoulders. His son is carrying the wood that's going to burn him. That walk had to be a horrible walk up that mountain. And then his son turns and says, Dad, where's the the sacrifice? And then Abraham said, God's going to provide. But can you imagine that tension? Can you imagine that turmoil back and forth? Every painful step that Abraham takes up that mountain thinking I should just turn around. This hurts too bad. This is costing, amen, too much. But he didn't. He just kept walking. And then he got up there. And this is the thing that blows my mind. I want you to note that because we just kind of skip over this. So many times when we read this passage of Scripture, it says he bound Isaac. What does that mean? That means the boy was not just sitting and allowing because he knew what was fixing to happen. So as his son, more than likely, screamed out in agony, a father whose heart was brutally bruised tied him down. Then it said this. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that nothing, you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now, I love this. And let me explain to you why I love this so much. I love this because Abraham, all the way up to complete obedience, raised up a knife and God said no, I want you to, watch this, I want you to look over there to the side. There is a sacrifice with his head caught in thorns. <laughs> now watch this. It's like God said, hey, 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 Abraham, you don't have to kill your son. I'm going to kill mine. See, What God did, and this is so good, what God did was when Abraham was willing to renounce it all, when Abraham was willing to fully give everything over to God as a cost and he was prepared to pay it, then God said, now that you are willing to do that and I see that you are able to do that, I am now going to place something in that place. There is a gap, but I am going to fill it. And I'm going to fill it with a sacrifice that is needed. Now, this is the point I want to tell you. Everybody in here wants a great marriage, right? I'm an expert in marriage. I am. I've been married 26 years to that woman. And she'll tell you I'm the best at what I do. Don't speak, honey. Women should be silent in the church. But I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times we have all these different things where we want to say, I want my marriage to be good. I want my marriage to be good. We want good relationships with our kids. I've got a senior in high school that is about to graduate high school. And we are still trying to figure out what people talk about when they say empty nest syndrome. Because we're excited. We want good relationships with our kids. We want our relationships with our brothers and sisters to be so good. We want God to bless us and to show us favor. And so many times we are working so hard to make that relationship right that God says this, you're not willing to give up that person. If you want a good marriage, you better be prepared to give up your spouse. You better be prepared to give your kids to God. And then God's going to give you something in between to fill that gap. Listen to this. Watch this. 
Can you imagine the difference in the conversation that Abraham and Isaac had going up the mountain versus going down the mountain? Now Isaac is looking at Abraham and going, do you see what God did? And Abraham said, yeah, I've been telling you. God will provide. We just had the coolest experience. Isaac comes down with Abraham. Abraham going up the mountain, brutal face. Isaac looking confused, leaving the two, ser- the two servants there, coming back. Both of them had a grin on like you could not believe. And probably arm in arm, if not, Abraham carried him and said, let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you how good God is. Why? Because God said, Abraham, give me your son. And Abraham said, here he is. And God said, now that you've been willing to give it all up, I'm going to give you something you never would have had before. Some of you have toxic relationships in your lives. Maybe it's a relationship with addiction. Maybe it's a relationship with sin. Maybe it's a relationship in this world. Anything that is stopping you from getting to God, God says, you got to give it up. You got to walk away from it. You got to renounce it. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus says, if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. He said, let the, bed, the dead bury the dead. That's one of the things he told a guy that said, I need to go bury my family first. Basically what he's saying is this, guys, if you are hesitant, then you don't get it. You don't get what he did. You see, Abraham knew what God did for his son Isaac. Isaac knew that God delivered his dad. And because they knew Jesus in such a powerful way, their experience changed their perspective on life. When you go to sin, man, isn't this good? I used to have all kind of sin issues in my life, all kind of stuff. And now you ever notice that when you, when you renounce sin and you come in contact with that sin, it stings? Like it just kind of, almost like you'd say you're offended, right? When things happen, why is that? Because of an experience I had with Jesus changed my perspective on the way I see certain things in my life. You see, the experience I had with Jesus changed the way I see my wife. Do you know who my father-in-law is? Y'all might not know. But my father-in-law is God Almighty. That's his daughter, (laughs) And I better treat her (laughs) like that's my father-in-law. You see what happens when we truly have that experience with Jesus? We count that cost or we're willing to say, God, if there's anything in my life that is stopping me from getting to you, I renounce it right now. So much so I hate it. I hate it. I want to push it away. And I want to fall in love with you. And God says, when you do that, There's a sacrifice that I sent on a cross. His name was Jesus. And I'm going to put him in that place that you left that gap. And what it's going to do is change your very perspective on life. Don't let nobody tell you when you become a Christian, everything gets easy. That's a lie. But Jesus says there's going to be gaps in your life when you become a Christian. There's going to be things that happen that you didn't plan on. He said, that's okay. I'm going to put the sacrifice in the gap. Are you counting the cost of actually what you're doing? Because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And you cannot have a relationship with the Father unless you first go through me. So let me ask you a question. Now, let's just be honest. You might have your hand on God. But what else you got your hand on that you need to let go of? Because God says, see, it don't work that way. 
we come in here, we worship, we lift up Jesus' name. Now, I want you to, to hear me when I say this, because one of the things that we read in Luke chapter 14, it says, a man does not bear his cross. Take it up. He's not worthy to be my disciple. Guys, I want to say something, and I'm going to close with this, and I want you to hear this. It is not enough to simply adore the cross when you're not willing to bear it. Don't come in here and sing your songs. Lift your hand if you're not willing to bear the cost of the cross. We have made an industry out of adoring something we are not willing to pick up and walk with. It is time. What are you willing to renounce right now? For Jesus to come in and fill it. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. And I am so thankful, God, that you have totally changed my 